Hey guys, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So in this video, um, this is the last chunk of our, you know, sidestep looking at the Mediterranean just before Justinian's armies go into it, and really a bit after as well, so we understand what the societies they're encountering kind of look like. Um, and then after this video, we'll get back to Theodoric's Italy, and then eventually Justinian himself, the survival of the Roman Empire in the East, uh, and his wars of reconquest. Now, in this video, what I want to focus on is, you know, still this theme of, like, power structures um, and cultural change, but specifically what I want to focus on here is probably everybody's favorite topic, uh, blood feuds, warfare, violence, that stuff. So, before we get going, I have to yell at my cat, get down, Octavia. Get off the fish tank, because the last time you were up there, you fell in the fish tank. Don't make me take off this microphone. Yeah, it's what I thought. Okay, now let's get going with this. So, um, in late antiquity, so roughly 200, 250, 300-ish as a starting date to, depends where you want to end it, you know, 600, maybe, maybe 700. Um, the late Roman aristocracy had very specific ideas about what it meant to be an aristocrat, what it meant to be um, specifically a man. So for the late Roman aristocracy, the whole point of being an aristocrat, of being wealthy, um, is that you pursue this thing called otium. This is the Latin version of, like, leisure time. So to be an aristocrat, um, you receive this glorious, wonderful education. You have to have memorized many of what we consider now to be like the classics. Um, you are expected to quote them to kind of not only show off your education, but to fill in for some emotional feelings. So if you are moved in a certain way, maybe you have to quote Homer or Plutarch or uh, one of the other big Greek and Roman writers. You are using that education and your knowledge of multiple languages that you potentially gain. So Latin, Greek, um, definitely in the Christian era, like Hebrew. Um, you're using it to pursue scholarship, cultural studies. To be an aristocratic male, you have to look a certain way. You have to be, um, you know, maybe lightly tanned. You have to be fit, but not overly jacked. Because if you are overly muscular... Um, that implies that you are doing, you know, like manual labor. You're not devoting enough time to OTM, to cultural studies, to scholarship. Um, so in bed, it doesn't matter who you sleep with, you have to be the one in charge. If you're taking it, you're not manly, you're a woman, because you're on the receiving end. It doesn't matter who you sleep with, man or woman, slave, uh, free man, boy, girl, doesn't matter. You have to be dominant. Doesn't matter, you have to be the one in control. And then, this is partly where, you know, they get interested in um, monasticism and Christianity. You have to be in control of your emotions. And you have to control your uh, lewdness, your bodiness. So this is why a lot of late antique aristocrats like Stoicism. Because that's part of the whole point of it. In the aftermath of the Western Roman collapse, when... Roman aristocrats start going over to the barbarians, that starts changing, and what we see is the following. I've got this outlined nicely in three little boxes here, but basically what you start seeing um, among the late Roman aristocrats as they are going over to the barbarians, as they're trying to work within these new kind of semi-Roman successor state things like Visigothic Spain, the Frankish Kingdom in Gaul, um, definitely in Theodoric's Italy, and definitely in Anglo-Saxon Britain, to the extent that we even know anything about that, because the sources are really, really tough to deal with. Uh, we see three things. The rise of a militarized aristocracy. So, we see an aristocracy that moves away from Otium. They can still uh, understand Latin. Many of them probably can read. I don't know about writing. That's a little tough to determine. But we see the rise of a militarized aristocracy, and then going along with that, we see the rise of, um, you know, I guess, war sports. Hunting, um, eventually jousting, eventually dueling. So, 
My point is that the aristocracy is taking on this culture of violence. But it's not just outright violence. As we'll see in this video, it becomes uh, ritualized, it becomes socially controlled. And then there is the adoption of a more muscular physique, which obviously goes along with weapons training, wearing armor, hunting. You have to be fairly strong to do this stuff. Maybe not bodybuilder size, but you have to have the muscular endurance to be able to do this for a while. So my point is that the whole conception of what it means to be a noble, to be an aristocrat, and what that physically looks like in the early medieval world, it starts to change. And this is really what starts to mark off. Well, it's one of the things that starts to mark off late antiquity from the early medieval period. Now, going along with the rise of a militarized aristocracy, we see the rise, especially in Gaul, um, and especially in Britain. We see the rise of cultures of hospitality um, and food and drink culture. So, the little example I've got for you here is that in 384, St. Martin of Tours, who we've talked about in other videos, he goes and he has dinner with uh, Emperor Magnus Maximus. These guys disagree fundamentally on certain points of Christianity. But, nevertheless, they go and do this. Skip forward about 400 years-ish in 732, uh, Charles Martel, who we'll talk about in other videos, he goes to a feast. And eventually, he gets into some disagreements with his host. And he gets up, and he leaves. And by getting up, and by leaving, he makes it very, very clear that these differences, whatever they were, can't be overcome. And by leaving his host, by leaving... Uh, the hospitality. By leaving the food and the drink on the table, he makes it very clear to them that they're no longer friendly. They are now enemies. So food and drink take on this huge importance socially and culturally in the early medieval world because if you're bringing somebody into your house, well, maybe not your house, your uh, hall, drinking hall maybe, and you're giving them your food, well, what does that entail? It means you have to come in, it means you have to trust the person enough to understand that the food probably is not poisoned. You have to be maybe not disarmed, um, but you have to be comfortable enough with the other person that you're not fearing assassination or attacks. So maybe you have your weapon on you, but you're not going to draw it. You have to trust the other person. If at any point you feel there is a problem and you get up and you leave, you disrespected your host and you make it clear to them that you are no longer on good terms. This is part of the culture of food in early medieval Europe. So when you read in like, you know, old Anglo-Saxon poems and tales like Beowulf, uh, you read about this stuff in Frankish sources, definitely in Old Norse sources. This is why this is important. Okay, so as that's happening, um, aristocrats start encountering these new problems that they have to deal with. And we'll talk about that more in a minute, but this is just like a brief introduction. So what do these aristocrats have to deal with? Well, after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, it survives, maybe not politically, although some have made that argument, um, but it definitely survives culturally and um, to an extent socially through the Roman Catholic Church. So... What that means is that kings, dukes, counts, whatever, whatever aristocratic title you want to give these people, they have to deal with two things. One, they have to deal with the Pope, um, and then they have to deal with more local concentrations of church power. Bishops, itinerant priests, uh, monasteries that eventually have large chunks of land given to them, so these become power units in their own right. The kings have to play church politics, as represented by my um, you know, bishop chess piece inside my circle here. And then they have armed bands, uh, comitatus, if that's how we want to think of it, maybe uh, bucolari. You have armed followers. Well, those followers, you got to do something with them, right? So this is where the drinking hall comes into play, and you're expected to take care of your followers. So it's not just, uh, um, I'm going to make you my vassal in exchange, you fight for me. It's a two-way street. 
if the vassal at any time feels that the lord is not holding up his end of the bargain, they could, in this period, potentially leave. So that gets back to my whole point in the early chunk of the series uh, about the, you know, feudalism thing. This idea that the power structure is like a pyramid, it's top down, um, it's fairly concrete, maybe somewhere along the line there's a liege lord, and the vassal is held in service to the guy above him. It's not that simple. It's fairly fluid, and there are other power structures through which the vassals can work. So at some point, if the lord pisses off the vassal, they can leave, and potentially there's not necessarily a problem, although sometimes there are. It's very um, situational. But that gets back to my point, we should not think of this thing, feudalism, as a, a concrete system. So let's expand on that a little bit. What all of that means for the early medieval period, um, and for aristocrats, specifically Frankish aristocrats, is the following. So we have this system where um, vassals or other retainers, right, armed men, are housed by their lord, usually in drinking halls, at least in northern Francia, definitely in Britain, um, in chunks of what is today like Germany, in the Low Countries, definitely in Denmark we see this, um, definitely in like Norway, especially in the early stages of the Viking era. So we have this system where armed followers are housed and fed by their lord, and in exchange, these people pay their debt of loyalty, and they've sown and they've shown their oath of loyalty to the Lord by consuming his food and drink. This is a bond of trust that is um, demonstrated publicly because you're trusting your Lord to take care of you and not poison your food. You repay this with military service. In small numbers, maybe, uh, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 100 people. This works really, really well because the Lord can afford to get the resources to do this. But... When we get into larger units, this becomes a problem. Why does it become a problem? Well, because if you're trying to feed, I don't know, 500 people, let's say maybe a thousand, maybe that's all you've got. How are you going to be able to build a hall or a structure big enough to house all of them? How are you going to get enough resources, you know, meat, vegetables, beer, water to feed these people? Aristocrats start running into problems. So then with land politics, what we see a little bit in the Visigothic Kingdom and definitely in Francia and eventually um, in the Anglo-Saxon Kingdoms, okay, is the parceling out of land. Now this is not the giving of land in exchange for military service um, to be held in perpetuity. That's an oversimplification. And that's not what happens. What actually happens is, and this is where the whole feudal model for, you know, land for military service doesn't really work, is because if you read the primary sources, if you read the documents, and there's a really good book on this um, by this scholar named Susan Reynolds. It's called Fiefs and Vassals. If you really want to deep dive, check it out. It's like a thousand pages, so I would be careful with that. I would read reviews, maybe if you wanted to get the gist of it. Um, but her point is that when she undertook this study of land tenure, especially in Britain, what she found was that not everything was for military service. The majority of it probably was not for armed service. Well, then what is it for? It's for um, rent, so you're acting as a landlord. It could be um, giving you land in exchange for, well, you're going to be my uh, legal advisor in times of trouble. You're going to be my commercial advisor when I need to reassess taxes and deal with economics. So it's not just military service. You're giving out land to different types of people in exchange for different types of services. Some of it's armed, some of it's military, but not everything. And that land is not given out um, permanently. There are many, many examples, especially in the Frankish kingdom, of land being given out for... A set period. Depends on the contract. Every contract is different. Maybe it's for three generations. This is usually what we see. And then it goes back to the original owner. Uh, maybe it's one generation. Maybe it's two. Maybe it's five. It depends what the land is being given out for, how big it is, how prosperous it is, and how loyal the Lord perceives the vassal to be. So, again, back to my point with the feudalism thing, it's not this nice top-down pyramid. It's a really flexible scheme. It's not so much vertical so much as it is um, horizontal in terms of power structures.
Now, when we talk about politics of land and warfare, military service, this is where we get into the whole blood feud thing. So, uh, what is a feud? It's a prolonged, bitter struggle between two parties. A blood feud, specifically, is a prolonged, bitter struggle between two families. So, as demonstrated in my three boxes here, you know, going from left to right, if you're an aristocrat, um, and you're gonna give out land, you're gonna try to build a stable power structure for yourself, well, who are the most loyal people that you can depend on? Is it the guy you pulled out of the woods? Or is it your blood, your family? The answer is, it's your family. So aristocrats then have family um, and other extended members. So in this period, a family is not necessarily just your blood kid, not like your brother, your cousin, your uncle, that's included. But it could also be, um, you know, long-term family friends. It could be advisors etc. You give them land in exchange for support. And these aristocrats, okay, feel they have a duty to back up and protect their family members. And this goes both ways. So then, if there's an issue, say, with your cousin, even if they're on the other side of the kingdom, you're expected to maybe not go to war to support them, but definitely back them up, at least politically, back them up with resources. Um, and if there's a problem, you're expected to take up arms and fight in defense of your family. If you don't do this, you are not a man. If you don't do this, you are not a man. This is a big deal, especially in the Frankish Kingdom, um, where gendered conceptions of violence come into play, where masculinity is attached to war and blood feuding and violence. Although, and we'll talk about this in another video, um, there's been a lot of work done in the past it's 2021 I'm going to say the past 30, 35 years, on degendering violence in the Frankish kingdom, which shows that it's not just men who do this, it's um, women as well. And there's, a, and there's a specific example we'll talk about in a different video um, where a Frankish noblewoman felt her honor to be uh, besmirched. So she raised an army and laid siege to her father's monastery till she got what she wanted. It's a really cool story, and we'll talk about it again in a specific video. But my point here is that Aristocrats are family, you have to defend that family, and this is where blood feuds come into play. So to go into a bit more detail with this, and again, this is where the, the problem of thinking about uh, medieval society as feudal starts breaking down, is, I mean, these kinship structures, these power structures, they take on different forms depending on where you are. Some of them are uh, patriarchal, that is, male-dominated. Some of them are matriarchal, female-dominated. The problem, though, is that, you know, what does it mean to be family? What does it mean to be kin? Um, this isn't, as I mentioned a second ago, not just blood relations. This is not just your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, etc. This is also family friends. These are advisors. These are uh, people you've known for a long time. Somebody you feel some kind of relationship with. Some kind of loyalty to. And most of them, most of these structures are not... Um, overly formalized in the sense that, well, we're all family, we stick together. Maybe you've got that one guy in your family who's like a black sheep, maybe he's a troublemaker, and you don't want to support him because if he does something stupid, your whole family can be dragged into it. So maybe collectively, you ostracize him. Or maybe a couple of your cousins decide, well, no, I don't want to be in your power structure, I'm going to go form my own. Um, this is not a counter to this notion of like a feudal hierarchy. This is a separate power structure that exists alongside it. So it complicates this whole picture. What that means is that people have loyalty to their lord, who they're getting land or something else from, and to their kin, to their family, blood or otherwise. Now, if your family, if your kin and your lord get into a dispute, well, who do you support? Well, this notion of feudalism dictates that, well, they should support the lord. But that's not always what happened. Again, this is why this model doesn't really work. Because it kind of tries to cram everything into this one system, which is not reflective of actual early medieval society. It's way more complex than that. So if there's a problem between your lord and your kin, you as the vassal, you have to make a choice. And every situation is different, with different rules, and thus different consequences. Now, going along with this whole thing, you know, blood feuds, um, violence, etc., 
is the eventual creation in early medieval Europe and extending into high medieval Europe, definitely, um, is this notion of an honor culture. So, typically, not, not always, but typically, these feuds, these problems that um, kin groups run into, these are relatively short. Um, there is this thing, we'll talk about it in a dedicated video, called Vergil, that means, like, life money, blood money. Um, it's not quite as simple as everybody has a price attached to them, and if you kill somebody or you injure somebody, you are supposed to give the family money in compensation. That's that's part of it. It's a little more complex, and we'll talk about it in a dedicated video, because it is, you know, complex. But my point is that stuff like that tends to make these feuds relatively short. There's a problem, you deal with it, and after it's dealt with, if you consider your honor to be restored, um, or at least not damaged any further, then you're good. You can go your separate ways. Or those enemies, those different power groups, if they work things out and they gain a healthy respect for each other, could integrate. They become allies and friends. This happens all the time. And it's because of stuff like this, because there is a culture of violence, of warfare, of honor, that eventually, not, not right away, but eventually, um, aristocrats, specifically in Francia, start looking at the Eastern Empire, the survival of Rome in the East, right, this thing we typically call the uh, Byzantine Empire, they start looking at the nobility here as uh, effeminate, girly, weak, because they don't fight. They're not overly violent. Their notion of masculinity, um, it diverged to the point where there are two very different gender power structures <laughs> in medieval Europe. There's the western chunk, where it's violence, war, and honor, and then there's, there's the eastern chunk, where it's uh, religion, scholarship. It's very much a continuation of otium, of late antique methods of doing things. So, what we see then, in this divergence in gender roles and gendered power structures, is, again, one of the dividing lines between the late antique world and the early medieval. Now it's because of this, and this is my last point uh, before I end the video, it's because of stuff like this. Violence, blood feuds, uh, war, honor, culture, kingship, etc. That many historians for decades, if not at least a hundred years, have looked at the early medieval period, well not the early medieval period, the, the medieval period generally as being uh, more Germanic, more German, more barbarian than Roman. There's more change than there is continuity. That's not really the case. All across medieval Europe, especially in the territories of the former Western Roman Empire, so Spain, Italy, uh, Britain, Gaul, there is a continuation, there is a survival of Roman culture, uh, Roman institutions, so Roman law, and then we see the blending of stuff, the blending of Germanic and Roman culture, and that's really what, um, you know, early medieval stuff comes out of is this blending situation. The key dividing line, though, the real dividing line in Europe, if you want to make the case for this, is the body of water that we call the English Channel. Because in the British Isles, especially in the former Roman province of Britain, um, stuff goes its own way pretty quickly. And then, eventually, when the Viking Age starts, Northern Europe as a whole kind of branches off and becomes its own thing. It's part of the medieval world is part of medieval Europe, but at least in the early period, it goes a very different way, and we'll talk about that uh, once my medieval warfare series picks back up. So on the continent, just to sum everything up, what we see is that, um, you know, Roman institutions survive, and they serve a purpose, but on the islands, they disappear pretty quickly. What you have to keep in mind, though, is that due to all of this, these are um, the key intellectual cultural and social shifts in Western Europe. This is when we start seeing people stop referring to themselves as Roman and calling themselves Frankish in an increased um, capacity. This is when identities start to change. So, to no small degree then, when Justinian's armies come in, when the Romans come in and they come to conquer the Romans, because these people still thought of themselves as Roman in the 500s, this is really the key dividing line, because one group, uh, and this is 
what makes primary sources like the Varii so disturbing is that one group has to understand, they have to come to the realization that this term, Roman, no longer applies to them. Well, if you're not Roman, what are you? You're something else. This is how and why the early medieval period begins. So, this is it for this series, guys. We're done. And then when we pick back up, uh, we'll get going again with Theodoric's Italy and then Justinian's Reconquests. So I hope you all enjoyed. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all next time.